I have str uh, struggled with the question of can we trust the Bible as a whole? Uh, and I struggled with that in my early 20s in a deep way. Um, I went through a time actually of quite significant doubt when I was around 21, 22. You were around at the time. Mark was in Cambridge, great help. Uh, and uh, the Lord brought me through those, having to work through a lot of things. But I certainly looked at uh, liberalism and secular approaches to the Bible from the inside within my own heart. Here's a fast one. Can we trust the Gospels by Peter J. Williams? A Probably the best short little book you can read now, most up-to-date book on why trust that the Gospels are historically reliable. You see, Bart, a few minutes ago, said that some things cannot be reconciled, then a few minutes later said, you can reconcile anything. Um, <clears throat> we have only error-ridden copies. Well, let's imagine a conversation between Ehrman and Augustine for a while, just if you can come with me on this. Uh, Ehrman leans over the shoulder of St. Augustine, who's got a Latin copy of John in front of him, and says, don't you know that scribes make errors when they copy? And Augustine would say, no one ever told me that. So why would Augustine think that the fact that, that Ehrman had told him that scribes make errors falsified Augustine's belief that God had given scripture and it was true? Augustine's able to distinguish very easily between the physical Latin copy he's got in front of him and the doctrine that he believes that God has given true words in true books. Dr. Peter Williams. Warden Tyndall House. You just I'm, came. I'm the principal of Tyndall House. But Warden. Yeah, the it principal. sounds like it sounds like you. They, they changed the title. For good reasons, I suppose. The Americans yeah. thought it's a jail. Yeah. <laughs> really. Yeah. So. <laughs> Dank je wel. Uh, kom ons praat yeah. klein beetje rugby. Uh, dus uh, as, yeah. uh, as New Zealand dus in die springbok. Ik ik uh, <laughs> speel geen rugby, maar ik heb een beetje rugby gespeeld uh, op school. Ja. Yeah. Uh, ja, dus ik ben uh, naar Wales geweest. Ja. Uh, yeah? uh, Wat is? Uh, om, 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 om te spelen. Maar, Heel prettig. Ja, ja maar ik, ik, ik was niet zo goed. Ja. Yeah. Zo so, uh, een vraagje. Ja. Yeah. Als New Zealand. Die All Blacks spelen ja. rugby in Zuid-Afrika, ja, ja. die springbokken. Voor wie zal jij ondersteunen? <laughs> dus uh, ja, ik, uh, ik steun geen, uh, ja, geen team. So Peter, um, I had a wonderful time at Tyndall House for a number of years during my doctorate and so on, and we had lots of chats and went to church together. But um, I reviewed some of your videos uh, recently and. Um, I want to start off asking you about your own doubts mm -hmm. as an undergraduate. You've mentioned that a couple of times, but yeah. can you unpack that in a little bit more detail? What was it and how did you get through it? Yeah, so I um, grew up in a Christian family. Um, I think I'd read the Bible more than three times before I kept, went to university. I think I'd probably read the whole Greek New Testament through before I went to university. So I had a good background and I started my first two years doing Greek and Latin. In the third year, I switched across to Hebrew and Aramaic, um, and so I was involved in studying the Bible, and that's when I think I encountered people who knew the Bible extremely well and didn't believe it. And um, up to that point, I suppose I'd always been encountering people who, when they didn't believe the Bible, it was really because they didn't know much of what it was, and here were people who did know what it was and, and, and didn't believe it. And that uh, shook me. They were able to ask questions I couldn't answer. Um, and so... And I, you, do you remember one or two of those? Yes. I mean, I remember being set an essay on the dating of Deuteronomy and uh, reading S.R. Driver on the date of Deuteronomy and finding that he had answered uh, questions that I couldn't really deal with. Now, I now look back and think, wow, what an illogical... Um, piece he wrote because there's lots of possibilities which were just excluded in his reasoning uh, but at the time um, it felt very powerful and so I um, remember specifically that it was that essay which uh, sent me into a period of doubt which lasted uh, yeah, a couple of years but um, gradually recovering from that um, people got put around me to help me. Yeah, just pause there. Yeah, yeah, sure. Just unpack that. Tyndall House, there, 
who was there? Was Bruce Winter there at the um, time, or who was there? Yeah, he was. I mean, uh, it, no, it wasn't uh, so much. Um, well, uh, D. A. Carson was at Tinder House at the time. I remember having a, um, a helpful uh, lunch uh, with him. I wasn't studying at Tinder House. Um, you know, he wasn't able to answer all my questions either. Um, but you know, that and other meetings were uh, helpful. But at the end of the day. Um, part of, I think, the realisation is, and this is a normal research discovery, that there are lots of questions that you don't have answers to. But, and this is the vital change, whereas at one stage in study it seemed like the number of questions just go up and up and up, and so you're thinking, wow, there's like a, an infinite expanding number of questions, and this can feel very destabilising. Yes. After a while, um, I began to realise, no, the number of questions is not going up. Um, what's simply happening is that um, some of the same questions are coming back dressed up differently. Okay. Um, and so there's actually a, you know, a, a finite number of, 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 of types of question and, and so on. Um, and um, it may take half a minute to ask a question, which takes you 20 years to get an answer to. And that's just the nature of questions and answers. Um, and so, given how little humans know, um, then it should be more normal not to know things. So I think, partly, I, I think it would have been more helpful if in my Christian upbringing there was a bit more of preparation for the idea that there are unanswered questions at the same time as a proper training on how to get answers to questions. Now, you know, neither of my parents have been to university. There, there wasn't necessarily, uh, you know, and they, they were you know, very good parents. Um, I didn't necessarily have the, um, yeah, uh, enough people around me in that background to prepare me for what I was encountering. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, God helped me through that. Okay. You went to church every week during that yes, whole I process? Did, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, which church was that at the time? Well, I was going to Cambridge Presbyterian Church and then switched over to Eden Baptist Church. Um, and, yeah. Okay. And um, Tyndale House, not at feet... Yeah, you went to Tyndale House for a while then. I, I, I visited Tyndale House uh, very early on as an undergraduate, but I didn't start going there mm. until 1993 uh, as a postgraduate uh, in my... Uh, master's degree when I, I started yeah. having a desk yeah. uh, there, yeah. so that was really my fifth year of study okay. uh, when I, I started. All right. on that. Um, okay, I gave you a piece of paper there, mm -hmm. and the first paragraph, it comes from the uh, uh, secular sort of atheist website about the Pentateuch, so yeah, yeah, sure. if you want to read a bit of that and just try to think how you would have uh, thought about that when you went through your crisis of faith and how you will be able to respond now after more than 20 years um, I think it's the other way around um, is that, Yeah, yeah that's, that's the paragraph if you want to just read a bit Should I read it out loud? Yeah, yeah uh, The Bible is believed to have been cobbled together from about four different sources referred to by the abbreviations E, J, P and D P stands for the priests who began to write down the Bible in the 6th century BC. D is the Deuteronomist responsible for the writing of the book of Deuteronomy. Then there is a fifth player, R or Redactor, an editor who helped stitch the various versions together. E and J refer to two different early versions, one of which uses Elohim as its usual word for God, and the other of which uses Yahweh, Y-A-H-W-E-Y. <laughs> which was later transliterated as Jehovah. Um, Cobbled together. Yeah, yeah. so I mean, if I were um, a professor marking that paragraph, I would be giving it a fairly low grade. Um, and there are just lots of problems with it. Having said that, it is, of course, the sort of thing that people can assert and get away with. Um, I mean, firstly, it's talking about a theory of these four different um, sources and it's declaring them as fact and the particular dates that they come from as fact, the existence of these things as fact. And then it's applying them to the entire Bible when this theory is only about the first five books of the Bible. Um, and uh, it's not allowing you to have you know, any variation or quibble about this. 
Um, I, I just think there's all sorts of problems with this. And how do we now identify sources at all? Um, so I would have thought that uh, a bit more humility would be appropriate about knowledge. How would you have responded during your phase of doubt, and how would you um, now be able to refute all of well, this? Well, I, I think at the stage of doubt, I, I would have had um, doubts about this statement as well. Um, and I think I would have been able to see that some of the things are assertions rather than proven. Um, now, I think I would be able to um, dig in a bit more and uh, talk about just how arbitrary uh, the assigning, for instance, of um, the P priest material to the 6th century BC is. There are people who date these things different ways, but also you've got to look at how one isolates material that you assign to priests. I mean, there aren't verses that come labelled I am by a priest. <laughs> uh, so, so how and how does one decide to, to group these things together? And I think there are um, there are so many steps to confusion behind this mm. um, that it actually takes a lot of time to pick apart. Sometimes, like when you have a, a very ropey essay, to do a proper critique of it would take longer than the essay itself because you almost have to explain why every single phrase mm. is taking things for granted. So, I mean. So why is it so difficult uh, in the academy, in Old Testament scholarship, to make a case for what you have just described for us? Um, well, I mean, I do think that there's, um, there's a, a certain inertia uh, in, in the system. Even 200 years of German scholarship? Well, I mean, it, for me it's very interesting that, you know, people are, are following the dating of Deuteronomy to the time of Josiah, um, that, you know, De Vetter came up with close to 200 years ago. Yes. When he was making that dating before any ancient Near Eastern law code had been discovered. I mean, it's just worth bearing in mind the sort of the history of scholarship. Um, most of the ancient Near Eastern law codes we know are from the second millennium. They're not um, uh, late. So there's a whole set of hypotheses behind here about who writes what when. Um, and I think... Because we don't have a huge lot of really um, strong archaeological evidence from ancient Israel combining text with history, it, it gives people a lot of free reign to assign things to particular times and they can decide what goes on in the 6th century. But sure, how much is really solidly known that the 6th century BC was like that at all? Yeah. How many really hard facts you have, I mean, like museum pieces that you, you can say, and th there aren't that many. Yeah. Um, you guys are busy with quite an exciting long-term project, and we've been talking in the car now about a number of positive things going on. Yeah. Can you just say something about that as an appetizer for, for Old Testament? Yes, I mean, we're building a database of names of the ancient world. We've been working through the ancient Syrian city of Alalakh, the Middle Bronze of Late Bronze Ages, mm -hmm. and now working through uh, and comparing that with the Bible, looking at how names change over time. So one of the things we're looking to do is um, do some more rigorous study of the names of individuals in the Old Testament um, and uh, see what's going on in terms of the age of names. Now, obviously, that doesn't give you the same thing as the age of the texts, um, but I don't think it's easy to date writings, but you can date contents, I suppose. And so that's something I'm interested in doing. So it's almost like trying to do what Richard Borkham did with names and you've done with the names in the New Testament, trying to do a rigorous analysis of Old Testament texts. Yeah, so obviously it, it, you, you, you don't know before a study what you're going to discover, but there are certain things which are already pretty well known. So for instance, the Persian names mm -hmm only come up really towards the end of the Old Testament period, yes. when Nehemiah and Esther, that's where they're more possible. Yes. Uh, we know that names with Yahweh as an element in are not found in the first five books of the Old Testament and then they gradually sort of uh, creep up. We know that there are certain forms of name um, where we get imperfect in Hebrew, mm. which
which are prominent towards the beginning. So Joseph Yosef is a, an imperfect. Ishmael, Ishmael is a, a, another one. Yitzhak, Isaac is another one. And that these become less common over time, both outside and inside the Bible. So there are certain things we, we can say. Uh, we think there are going to be quite a few more patterns. Right. Uh, including finding certain names to be common within tribes. I mean, so you get um, in the book of Genesis chapter 3, Ehud, son of Gera, who's from the tribe of Benjamin. And the funny thing is, all four Geras we know about in the Bible are from the tribe of Benjamin. So you can actually look at these specific things and start saying, ah, it seems that there, this was popular within that tribe. Yeah. So some of these observations will be tribal, geographical, some of them will be to do with time. Yep. Um, there will be lots of, of things to do. Yeah. And also, I think we will find a certain tendency for names to fit well with the stories they go with. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Wonderful. That sounds fascinating. Let's jump to Genesis 1 to 11. Um, um, why do you believe that Genesis 1 to 3 is not copied or, you know, against the backdrop of Babylonian or other kinds of creation myths? Well, I think um, the circumstances under which Genesis 1 to 3 would be copied from Babylonian stories uh, would only be um, if... Judeans, let's say, were in Babylon, were inspired by those stories, and then wrote what they did. Um, so that's a very particular sort of context. Um, and of course, um, firstly, we've got no firm evidence that one directly comes from the other. They're, they're not simply not close enough for that. So that there are definitely parallels, uh, but saying A comes before B, it, it, you know, there, there's no definite proof of that. Um, secondly, if the biblical text were written against anything, uh, so that was a prior background, it would be as likely as not that they would be written against something from the land of Canaan, right. which doesn't survive, yep. rather than something from the land of Babylon, which happens to survive, uh, but isn't quite the right time period or, or you know, the right place. So um, that's, that's another fact that's got to be considered. Right. I think... Um, it's important to be quite rigorous and strict about looking at parallels, observing similarities, but then being open-minded as to why those similarities are there. Is it that things have you know, independently been recorded, that A has influenced B or B has influenced A, or that they come from something else before them? Those are all the possibilities, and you should not narrow things down. It would be wonderful if you can give us a little list for some of our viewers of helpful uh, research on that because uh, it's uh, it's a minefield, especially I think in, well I'm a New Testament scholar, yeah. but I've always had this thing, um, I actually quoted your book on uh, the Gospels, uh, where I think it's page 132 or somewhere there where you spoke about creation and the fall and then you demonstrate how important it is uh, and you do this wonderful book on the names of the New Testament but if that is not based on history then yeah. we sit with a problem sure sure um, I mean looking at the biblical text itself I, I think what people often um, would argue against the unity of Genesis 1 to 3 yeah and so that that's another thing that you've got going on people are saying that Genesis 1 is a different source from Genesis 2 and 3 mm. Um, and I just think there's tremendous unity between them. Uh, Genesis 1 is all about things being good, God creating what's good. You then get to Genesis 2 and God said it's not good that man should be alone. And then Genesis 3 you get the, the um, you know, um, uh, uh, eating of the tree and knowledge of good and evil, mm -hmm. um, uh, good and bad. So you, you, you get these wonderful um, themes running through. Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 and 3 are very caught up with the question of what people eat, what yeah. things eat. Again, yeah. um, uh, that's there. Genesis 1, uh, full of um, blessing, and um, what you find is, um, you know, Genesis 3, you, you, you've got the curse. Um, the people say, well, the divine names are different. Genesis 1 is using the word Elohim, God. Uh, Genesis 2 and 3 is using the Lord God, or um, Yahweh Elohim. But 
that's not entirely the case because the serpent in Genesis 3 is very particular, only to use Elohim. So once you've accepted that uh, the author of Genesis 3 is able only to use Elohim, you've got no reason to say that can't be uh, you know, very closely connected with Genesis 1. Okay. So I think um, there, are, there are lots of things that uh, have a unity and imagining a Bible that just began with Genesis 2 would be so much less dramatic than what we currently have. Sure. Um, and I, I do think there is a, a, a wonderful sort of cosmic scale which you then home in, which, which works um, very well. Um, and yeah, there, there, there is a fundamental unity there. And so although, yes, there are questions about how exactly does the phonology work with, you know, what's what's happening with the planting of the garden early on in, in, yeah. in Genesis 2 and, and so on. None of those are problems that can't be solved. Yeah. Um, uh, but the um, the fundamental thing is that there are lots of things that draw these passages together. Yeah. Um, they enrich each other. And so someone would be really lucky mm. if they had two different sources that they could then... Um, combined together to make this grand opening to the Bible, uh, it, it, the, the material's far too convenient, uh, <laughs> if you see what I mean. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, we're almost at Tyndale, and um, can we ask another few questions there? Sure. Then you can maybe show for some of our friends what yeah. you guys are doing there. Yeah. And I remember this, there was nothing when we were here. Lots of barbecues here on the left Friday nights. weird to be back after how many years? Seven, eight years. There was a bench here. You could sit here. Yeah, yeah you had lots of American students phoning their, their parents in this little booth. Oh wow, this is amazing. Wow. Oh, it's beautiful. Now, I'll give you one more room. Yeah. We could film in. Yeah. Which is just over here. Oh, Bishop John Taylor. He was wonderful. I remember yeah, him so yeah. well. So this is now a great teaching room, you see. Mm. So you've got all of this. You're going to do your... Oh, stunning. Look at this. This is how you do Mick pa Nick Maper as a name in different cuneiform forms. Wow. So, yeah. so I don't know whether you want to film. We can film. Yeah, in that I think corner. so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Nice, yeah. This is beautiful. Well done. I remember when I was here, Peter Gurry was there. I took a nice celebrity photo for him. And all old books, mm. carpets, yeah. cutlery, old tables. Mm. This really looks beautiful. Well it done. does, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, Peter, first tell us, just briefly, why does Tyndall House exist? Give us a, for people who've never heard of yeah. Tyndall House in South Africa, why and why in Cambridge? So Tinder House exists to raise up uh, evangelical Bible scholars to serve the church. We want there to be experts who can equip the church to understand and trust the Bible. And we're wanting to raise up um, experts from around the world. So we bring people here from uh, around the world and uh, people come from around the world to study here. Why in Cambridge? Cambridge is an amazing academic setting. I mean, Cambridge University, that we're so close to, is usually in the top five of any universities globally. There are 106 academic libraries in Cambridge. Within the square mile that we exist, the electron was discovered, DNA was discovered, all sorts of things happened. More Nobel Prizes in Cambridge than France and Germany put together. So it's an amazing place. And so when people come here, they're able to get equipped, they're able to raise their horizons but also they get networked. So someone can come here from South Africa, but they're gonna meet people from uh, lots of other um, places and therefore they're going to uh, be 
more um, in touch with, with the body of Christ. Okay, what was happening in Oxford, Cambridge that made evangelicals feel we need to start something like Tyndale House? Give a, just tell us yeah. something about that background. Well, it's interesting. You know, Tyndale House began, uh, well, the, the property was purchased in 1944 before D-Day. So, oh, you wow. know, there's a vision to start a Bible research centre before, um, you know, the uh, future of, of the Second World War has really been secured. But there is a sense that um, evangelicals are being marginalised within uh, the uh, top universities and a desire to have a place where people could be mentored and equipped uh, to think as uh, evangelicals. Okay, so so you had a phase where you had theological liberalism that was very dominant. Mm -hmm. You had even 50s, 60s, people like Jeffrey Lamp, he was here, he, he denied the empty tomb, for instance. Mm -hmm. In Oxford, you've had it, a long history, 60s, 70s, Dennis Nynam, Maurice mm -hmm. Wiles, Don Cupid later yeah, on here. So you've got a long history of critical scholarship. Yep. So there was a, a need that the evangelical church felt that we need to try to be close to the academy and establish an institute yeah. where we can really raise scholars that will be able to offer good academic evangelical scholarship. Yes, and, and so our position has always been close but independent. Yeah. So we work closely with lots of people in Cambridge University, various of our staff have their own official positions within the university, but as an institution we are independent and we value that independence. And you don't offer degrees or certificates? Absolutely nothing. not, no, no. We, we're looking to equip people. Degrees are things we're quite ambivalent about. I mean, we, we like, it, it, it can be helpful for people to get them, but the funny thing is people can get degrees and not know very much, and not have degrees and know quite a lot. So uh, we don't want our focus to be on credentials. If, if Bruce never had a doctorate, for sure. instance, and others. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, some of your talks that I went through, um, I really enjoyed doing that after uh, several years, having been at Tyndale, and you tested some of your material and asked mm -hmm. me would sit and critique you and uh, mm -hmm. your, your, your gospel talks. Mm -hmm. That was fun to be here at that stage. Uh, and uh, I, I noticed that over the past couple of years, after you've debated about Ehrman a couple of times, mm -hmm. that your view of the authority of Scripture is very interesting, unique, that you do not base the authority of Scripture on proving every little text correct and historical. You have a, a different view, and you refer to Augustine in one of the talks. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to read you a quote and then you ask okay. you what you think about this. It must therefore be established that those who have been taught by the Holy Spirit find complete rest in Scripture and also that it carries its credibility within itself. That's a quote mm -hmm. from John Calvin's Institutes. Mm -hmm. Can you say something about that and whether that's part of how you see your yes. you understanding? Yes, so I think probably, I don't think I've got a unique understanding, uh, but I do think there is a, sometimes a misunderstanding, which is that the, the bar... Um, uh, a, a proof gets lifted too high or we might say that the burden of proof gets shifted in the wrong place and so people talk as if it's our job to verify independently every statement in scripture and and that's not the way that we deal with the trustworthiness of people in general um, what happens is once you've found that an individual is trustworthy in general you trust them on things that you simply have their word for uh, and that's normal and you know let's say you're in a marriage if you your wife says you know I've just been for a walk you don't say can you verify that to me you know you, you're you're in a he healthy relationship so that's where I think it's very strange if I'm expected to be able to find Abraham's tent pegs you know and never going to be able to discover uh, find them um, there's no reason to think that I should be able to so skeptics will argue that you're subjective because you've got a, a theological presupposition as the hermeneutical bedrock for your view of the authority of uh, Scripture. Well, no, no. I, I, I would say that um, I, don't, I don't think I'm more subjective than anyone else. I, I'm simply looking at rationality, and I'm saying it is rational to trust that Abraham existed. Uh, there are good reasons to think in terms of the testimony we have, in terms of the consistency with what we know, um, 
that's not to say someone cannot have a intelligent system in which they don't trust it existed, but I don't need to be able to um, take every isolated thing in the Bible as an isolated thing and then raise the probability above 50% on each of those things that when considered in an isolated way, mm. it should be judged more probable than not. Because at the end of the day, it's not about taking things in isolation. It's about taking them as a package of um, testimony. And that's rational. That's what we do in all sorts of other things. Uh, uh, related to that now, Calvin goes on and says, but on the other hand, after saying it's God that reveals to us and it's got its credibility within itself, he goes on and then says, but on the other hand, once we have accepted the scripture with, uh, with reverence, the things which could otherwise not have established certainty in our heart become suitable tools. The question mm. is whether that suitable tools is not um, on a, saying something different from you saying about its sort of rational and mm. its sort of consistency. You, you're very big on that in your book. Of course, mm. it's rational, it's consistent, makes sense. Uh, is, is that not maybe still that kind of a... Uh, evidentialist apologetic for trying to prove that it actually happened. Well, again, I'm, I, I totally avoid the word proof. Yeah. Uh, and when I say rational, mm. I mean with your mind well functioning. That's that's really what I mean. <laughs> um, and, and so, mm. uh, yeah, I'm not talking about some sort of rationalist uh, thing. So what I'd say is, look, take Abraham as an example. Now. Um, if we were to think back 500 years before archaeology had begun, mm. what evidence does anyone have for Abraham? The answer is, in the West, they sort of have 12th century manuscripts in Hebrew uh, and uh, 12th century AD. And, and when's Abraham? Well, he's about three millennia before that, 3,000 years. Well, that just seems like a complete leap. But of course, over time, what you find is um, more and more um, is discovered that pushes things earlier and earlier. So now um, we uh, archaeology has happened, languages have been deciphered. Suddenly you find, oh, yes, there are lots of people around Abraham's time and and, and for a thousand years after. But, you know, uh, not for three thousand years after who, who are called Ab, father, plus an extra element. There's a whole load of migration happening uh, from uh, uh, across um, the Fertile Crescent mm. around the time that he's doing. The way things are described um, fit broadly in the right patterns. And it's astonishing that in medieval manuscripts that have just been copied from one person to another to another, you'd be getting the sorts of descriptions that we're getting where... Um, the names fit, the cultures fit, um, with the broad patterns of what we know. And they're dealing with Amorites and things like that. Well, you look at the enemies across the Old Testament where, you know, in the early phase they're dealing with Amorites, then they're dealing with um, Philistines, then they're dealing with Assyrians and then Babylonians mm -hmm. and then Persians. Well, that basically fits what we know of discovered archaeology. Mm. Uh, and so those sorts of things are fitting well. And yes, we, we, we can't sort of go to a museum and say, here is something specific from Abraham. Um, you can actually, in Old Testament history, throw around hundreds of years mm. because things are not really precise in terms of um, what is shown to be when. But you can say in the very broad terms that if you compare the knowledge we had 500 years ago with the knowledge we had now, that. Abraham stuff in the Old Testament looks ballpark pretty plausible mm. and that that's striking and that's not what you would expect um, given skepticism really sure Peter um, let's just quickly talk about Tyndale House the past 20 years you've been here since 2007 mm -hmm. the warden um, what advice will you give to evangelical theologians theology students wanting to do a doctorate, given what you have learned during that mm -hmm. time, looking at so many students that uh, come and go, uh, you, you will have many different stories about mm -hmm. students that went through terrible 
uh, theological crises. And mm. if, what advice will you give? A couple of pointers. Yeah. Uh, to study at a secular university, what do you need in order to do that in a way that will bring glory to God? Well, I think it's important to know the Bible well before you begin, like very well. I've read it quite a number of times and ideally I've read the, the entire Bible through in its original languages so that you're not struggling on those basic skills. And I think as you have those sorts of things, you're also more able to see that some people that make quite a lot of noise in scholarly terms aren't what they're cracked up to be and so that gives you further confidence to be a little bit more um, confident critical mm. of of authority i think though that that's a, a key thing but then as you come uh to be um you know involved in a local church involved in a community of uh, scholars who are seeking to uh, honor christ so that's why it's great if people can come to uh, Tinder House, where there's a there's a, a community like that. Um, yeah, I think those are the main things. Yeah, and then be involved in a church. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, you have obviously seen many students come here. Um, I've I've got a couple of friends here. There are a number of them that went back to America and all over the world, and they are teaching there. What do you? What is your uh, thoughts on globally what's going on in the evangelical seminaries over the past 20, 30 years. There's loads of things going on right now and sexual ethics and stuff, loads of pressure. Um, compromise, how, how should evangelicals try to be faithful to Christ, keep on publishing uh, and uh, change their seminaries not to align with what's going on globally? Yes, I, mean, I think uh, seminaries in North America are under uh, pressure and some of it is simply demographic pressure. Uh, the numbers of people in Gen Z may be lower and the number of people who trust the Bible uh, is lower. Um, so, but in every generation you get new institutions emerging and thriving and you get some which are struggling. And I think what I generally see is that those institutions that put uh, honouring Christ first and are very firm on that and firm on uh, the delight of the scriptures, those are the ones that go forward and those who try and sort of make <coughs> uh, peace with alternative worldviews are, are ones that are going to struggle. Absolutely. Let's, let's finish. Um, you were the third son in your parents' house, so you were the baby. Mm. Yeah. Um, interesting, difficult. Uh, nice thing about being youngest uh, brother in my situation is I, I felt uh, that I could learn a little bit from watching my brothers and some of their own experiments and, um, you know, how that worked in relation to my parents and so on, uh, who, of course, were also learning how to parent. Um, so I, I felt that it was, a, it was a good deal for me. Last question came up. I was obviously uh, studying David Jenkins, Bishop of mm. Durham. <laughs> I remember vaguely you told me your dad was one of the protesters. protesters. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, Tell us just a bit about um, that. <laughs> yeah, so um, on the day when uh, David Jenkins was consecrated, uh, consecrated in uh, York Minster, uh, my, um, uh, a cousin of mine, uh, an older, older cousin um, who likes to protest to managed to enlist my dad to um, protest and he stood with a sign no resurrection no resurrection no christian faith and got a number of uh, different interviews on that stage he was a totally peaceful uh, protester outside and of course um, two days later later in a really quite remarkable uh, way the minster uh, was uh, struck by uh, lightning and that was even caught on film which is you know uh, quite a, um, an unusual thing um, of course, that all could just be coincidence. One wouldn't want to read things uh, in, 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 uh, to it too much, but it certainly felt very symbolic. So let's just wrap that up. So you told me in the car, Dad went to Winchester College. That's right. A very good education. And uh, he converted after finishing his, yep. uh, his schooling. And uh, last thought on this, uh, the house you come from, mm. uh, the impact that a parent can have on a mm. child. I, I had an interview with, with uh, um, uh, Oxford Don, who also reflected on, on dad. He, he, he went through struggles and he would sometimes in the margin write, 
what would dad think? Yeah. What would dad think? I, I think, yeah, the fact that my, I, I could trust my parents completely, you know, they never lied to me. They were uh, people you could always reason with, I think had a, a profound effect. And they were incredibly generous people. Uh, so, um, yeah, that, that, that was very important. And, you know, a house full of books. Wonderful. Uh, Peter, can we finish by you doing a short prayer, uh, mm -hmm. especially for South Africa? Are they, mm -hmm. they going through a difficult stage now? Um, at, uh, all sorts of things going on, seminaries mm -hmm. under pressure, uh, secular universities. If you want to do a prayer for evangelical theology students mm -hmm. struggling at this point to really uh, keep the faith. Yeah, okay. Lord, we uh, do want to pray for theology students in South Africa. Uh, that you'll be helping them to have huge uh, wisdom, uh, huge love and uh, integrity. And we want to pray that you'll give them uh, boldness and conviction uh, and a delight in the truth of your scripture and its relevance to every situation. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Dank je wel. Uh, kom ons praat yeah. klein beetje rugby. Uh, uh, dus, as, yeah. as New Zealand dus in die springboek. Ik, uh, <laughs> ik speel geen rugby, maar ik heb een beetje rugby gespeeld uh, op school. Ja. Yeah. Uh, ja, dus ik ben uh, naar Wales geweest. Ja? Uh, yeah. uh, Wat is? Om, om, te, om, om, om te spelen. Maar Heel prettig. Ik, ja, maar ik, ik, ik was niet zo goed. Ja. Yeah. Zo, so, uh, één vraagje. Ja. Yeah. Als New Zealand. Die All Blacks spelen ja. rugby in Zuid-Afrika, ja, ja. die springboeken. Voor wie zal jij ondersteunen? <laughs> dus uh, ja, ik, uh, ik steun geen, uh, ja, geen team.